Joshua, chapter 24. One final reminder. That's what we're looking at here in Joshua chapter 4. Let's read verse 1, give you an introduction, and we'll move through the chapter here. Chapter 24, the book of Joshua, verse 1. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers. And they presented themselves, and I want you to see, see this, and they presented themselves to God. Joshua is preparing to die. And because he's preparing himself to die, he's called for a final meeting, a final meeting with the nation. Now, he's already been ministering to that nation. We saw that in chapter 23, he had exhorted them to follow the Lord and had exhorted them to follow the Lord completely. He reminded them of God's faithfulness to them. He had warned them to remain faithful. So now he calls them together for the second and the last time. Now I want you to see this because to me this was interesting. I actually spent some time looking at this just as I was reading and preparing this study because I find it interesting how we are told that Joshua gathered all the tribes. And that's what it says in verse 1. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. But I want you to see how he concludes that in verse 1 when he says, and they presented themselves before God. This reveals to us how important this gathering actually is. He's having a meeting. Meetings occur every day. We know that. Meetings occur in various locations, and you can have a meeting for a variety of reasons. If you're at work, the supervisor or a boss might call for a meeting, so the employees show up. You can have an organizational meeting. You can have a meeting of athletic teams where a manager or a coach will speak to the players. You can have a meeting with the family. You can have a meeting with a city council. There are meetings that are held every day for a variety of reasons, but not every meeting is really that important. So I wanted to look at that for a minute as I lay this down because there are some meetings that are important. There are some meetings that are exceptionally important. Not all meetings are that important. Some of you know that. There's a meeting and the, bo the boss wants to have with you and he begins to share some things with you and you're, you're thinking, man... This is running into my timetable. I have things I need to accomplish. And he's just running on and on about things that we really don't need to know about, you know, not to use too much of the, of the paper towels in the bathroom and make sure we're on, you know, our breaks aren't too long. We're already familiar with that. Make sure we're here on time and, and give the product, you know, our greatest attention, etc. And you're there listening and you're saying to yourself, this meeting isn't that important. And some meetings really aren't, but there are other meetings that are. When we gather, when a church gathers for church services, it's always important to remember just whom we are meeting with. I want you to see that they presented themselves to God and they were not presenting themselves simply to Joshua. They were meeting together. They were hearing from Joshua. But it's important for us to understand that it was to God that they were presenting themselves. They assembled that they might hear from the Lord. They wanted to hear from the Lord. And that to me is a very important thing to say and to look at as we begin chapter 24, his final uh, convocation with the people, his final meeting, because even in verse 1, it makes it real clear to us that though Joshua is calling them, they're there for a greater purpose than to simply hear the leader of a nation. They're not just there listening, like if we were to call it from American terms, they're not there just listening to, we'll say, a president give an address. They're there to present themselves before God. They're intending, in other words, to hear the word from the Lord. And so it's always important for us to understand that some meetings simply are not that important and other meetings are exceptionally important and it, de it is determined the the importance of that meeting is determined simply by whom we are presenting ourselves to. So when the church gathers together, we're presenting ourselves to the Lord. When you look into the New Testament book of Acts, 
in chapter 10. There's a very interesting story there that illustrates presenting yourselves to hear from the Lord. When you look in the book of Acts in chapter 10, it speaks concerning a time that the apostle Peter uh, was staying in a place that is, at that time it was called Jaffa. Today it's referred to as Jaffa. And uh, he was staying there at the home of a man by the name of Simon, whose occupation was that he was a tanner. Now, while he's there at the home of Simon, the tanner, uh, God begins to answer a prayer that had been lifted to him by a Gentile by the name of Cornelius, who was a Roman soldier. He was a centurion. And God was speaking to Cornelius, and God said to him, I want you to send for the apostle Peter so that Peter can come and share. Now, Cornelius lived in the city of Caesarea. So he sent three men to Joppa. It was a trip of around 30 miles to the south. And as they were making their way to come and speak to Peter, to bring him back to Cornelius there in the city of Caesarea, Peter had gone to the rooftop and he had begun to pray. And while he was there on the rooftop praying, the Bible tells us that he went into kind of like a trance and he had a vision. And the vision he had was of a great sheet with all manner of animals, both clean and unclean. And as he sees this vision, and it occurs three times, as he sees this vision, a voice commands him and says to him, rise up, slay, and eat. And when that voice speaks to him and says, rise up, slay, and eat, the immediate response of the apostle Peter is no, because he says, I'm kosher, I've never eaten anything unclean. And that sheet contained unclean animals. So when the command came to him, rise up, slay, and eat, he said, I can't do that. I am I'm a, a kosher Jew, and I can't do that. And the, and the voice of the Lord speaks to him and says, what I have called clean, you're not to call unclean. Now, as he began to think on that vision, the Bible tells us that the men arrived at the tanner's house, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to the apostle Peter, and he said, I want you to go with them. And so the next day, he made a journey with them. He came to Cornelius' house. Now, Cornelius, according to uh, Acts 10, verse 24, Cornelius, in preparation, this is an important little aside here, in preparation for the apostle Peter, who was going to come and share with them, well, what he had done is he had assembled his close friends and his relatives that they might hear what the Apostle Peter had to say. Now, when I was reading that and preparing the study and rereading that, I thought to myself, how much like the early movement of Calvary Chapel that is. When somebody got saved, we didn't keep it to ourselves. We weren't ashamed of being Christians. We weren't embarrassed. You know, today people say, well, you know, the society has changed. It's turned against the idea of Christianity and the belief of Christ. It wasn't a lot easier back in, when I got saved in 1970. You didn't have a lot of people running around saying, oh, tell me the gospel, oh, young hippie. I would love to hear of Jesus. They didn't do that to us. They put us down. They said things about us. Pastor Chuck was spoken against even from pulpits in churches because there were those pastors who didn't like what God was doing through, through Pastor Chuck and, and the Jesus movement and, and believed that we were a bunch of, uh, of uh, just unwashed masses of individuals who were trying to find an easy way out of life. We didn't work and, and things of that nature. And, and it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for me as a young believer with the long hair and all of that to go and speak to people. Sometimes we think, oh, it was easier during that time. You know, ancient history back in 1970. No, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. But it was the right thing to do. It's what God had called us to do. It, it, the most selfish person on earth is the one who goes to heaven alone. And we were taught, take this good news and share it with people. Let them know about Jesus Christ. Do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world is shouting out loud right now, is shouting, shut up, Christians. And you know what Christians are doing? We are politely shutting up. It doesn't say that to Islam. It doesn't say that to any other message. It is saying that to the church. We need to wake up again in these last days, don't we? We need to wake up and say, I believe in the Lord, and, and I want my friends, and I want my relatives to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Cornelius did. He was in anticipation of, of the apostle Peter to come and speak to him the words of the Lord. He didn't want to hear them by himself. And so what's he do? He invites his close friends 
and he invites his relatives. Now, did every close friend of Cornelius show up? Probably not. Did all of his relatives come to his house to hear this? Most likely no. But that didn't stop him from inviting them, from asking them. I can still remember when I first got saved going to Calvary. I was 20 years old. And I can still remember being seated in that small chapel that was bursting at the seams with young people. And uh, the average kids, as I could see them, and as I remember who were there at that time in 1970, were probably anywhere from 18 to 22, 23 years of age. And every once in a while while we were there, one of the ministers would say, how many of you brought your mom or your dad today to church? And I can still remember seeing these hands go up. And then the young guys who were leading the service would say, Mom, why don't you stand up? And then you'd get this old woman standing up. She had to be at least 35 or 40. <laughs> and she would stand up with a red face. She was so embarrassed. But we'd welcome her. And we'd all cheer and say, yeah. And people would yell out, well, you're welcome, Mom. And that's what we would do. They would invite their friends and they would invite their relatives. Why? Here's the key. Because they wanted to hear the word of the Lord. And they wanted their friends and their relatives to do the same. I wonder in this room how many of us have friends and relatives who should hear the word of the Lord. And I wonder if it's not time for us to wake up again and say, let's invite them again. Come and hear what God has to say. Come and hear what the word of the Lord is all about. Invite your friends. Invite your relatives. Invite your neighbors. Invite them to hear what God has to say. And that's what Cornelius was doing. And so he invites his close friends. He invites his relatives that they might hear what Peter would say. Now, as they're gathering, Cornelius begins to speak. And as he's explaining to the apostle Peter the circumstances and all that, that led to him uh, sending his men to go and invite the apostle to come and see him. It's found in Acts 10.33. Cornelius said to him, So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God. We are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. We are all presenting ourselves to hear what God has to say. That is the proper attitude anytime I go to a Bible study or you go to a Bible study. That's the proper attitude. We are presenting ourselves not simply to the pastor or the Bible teacher. We are presenting ourselves to God to hear all that God has to say to our hearts today through his word. That's what we do. That's what we gather for. You see... Today, people will come to church and they can gather to an, in a church service for various reasons and it doesn't necessarily have to be because they've come to hear the things of God. There are those who will come to church sometimes with unrealistic expectations and so they come in with an unrealistic expectation and thus they leave disappointed if they sit through the entire study. They leave disappointed. Now, I expected something else. I thought that we'd have maybe some juggling monkeys and some, you know, I mean, they come expecting something different than they get in church for some reason. And, and we need to remember some basic things about, about what it means to gather. We need to remember that church services don't always make us feel comfortable. That sometimes when you go to church, we may even feel divinely uncomfortable. That there are times the Holy Spirit may speak to our hearts in such a way that it makes us feel necessarily so a bit uncomfortable because we're hearing what God's word says and we begin to measure ourselves by what it says. There are times that we go to church, we're disappointed because we don't like what's happening at that church or we might leave a service upset because we can see ourselves in light of God's righteousness. And, and then there are some people who don't want to gather. Uh, and this is really amazing because they might not even get along with everybody that they meet in church. They might have some problems with people. And, and so they say, well, I'm going to go someplace where I don't have problems with any of the people. And then it, it, how long does it take for you to find someone to have a problem with if you're looking for one? It really doesn't take much time at all. Why? Because we're, we're the problems ourselves. We bring it to every place that we go. And when we go there, we bring the problem. Why? Because we have unrealistic expectations. 
You see, when, when the church gathers, the church gathering together is intended by God for us to present ourselves, to present ourselves to God. And when we present ourselves to God, that's when we're going to be in the best position to hear from him. Like when Isaiah said, speak, your servant's listening. I want to hear what you have to say. Now, how is it that they're going to be hearing from God when they're presenting themselves? Well, they're going to hear from God because his word, his declaration will be delivered to them. And as they're there to worship and to hear from God, God will manifest himself. It's been said it is in the process of being worshipped that God communicates his presence to men. And so when you come with the right attitude and the right heart and you're worshipping the Lord and you're open to God, he's going to manifest himself to you. You know, when we gather together, and, and all of you know the basic routine of this fellowship, we're going to have a time of, of singing songs and worship to the Lord. The worship to the Lord isn't the throwaway section of the, of the church service, is it? You know, worshiping the Lord is setting the table for God to deliver his meal. We're opening our hearts to him, and we're saying, God, we worship and we adore you. We present ourselves to you. And so it's in the process of worshiping God that we open ourselves up to hear God minister to us. That's why it's important for us to be on time, to be there to hear from God and to worship him and to receive from God that which he has for us. You see, here in chapter 24, Joshua is closing his service to God. And uh, he's going to do so with what we would call today a solemn assembly. He determines to give a call for a renewal. We'll see this, a renewal of the covenant that Israel has had with the Lord. And he does this by assembling the leaders. And these leaders that he's assembling are actually the representatives of the nation. And so Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. The tribes are represented by their leaders and called for the elders of Israel, their heads, judges, officers. They presented themselves before God. Verse 2, and Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river, the river Euphrates, in old times. And they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau, I gave the mountains of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Also, I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to to what I did among them. Afterward, I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, brought the sea upon them and covered them. Your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. You dwelt there for 40 years, and I I brought you into the land of the Amorites who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. And they fought with you, but I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore, he continued to bless you. So I delivered you out of his hand. Then you went over the Jordan. And came to Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. But I delivered them into your hands. I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you. Also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. Verse 13, I have given you a land for which you did not labor, cities which you did not build. You dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him, with, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt serve 
the Lord. I want you to see this, and I'm just going to touch on this lightly. He's actually rehearsing how God has been gracious to them through their history. And the way that he is rehearsing this to them is by simple, simple reminder. He's saying, you know, God has cared for you from the time of your father Abraham. Now, by reminding them that God has been faithful and caring for them from the time of Abraham, he's simply saying to them with this reminder, seeing that God has been faithfully caring for you, be faithful to him. Now, as a way, and you'll see this, as a way of demonstrating your faithfulness to God, what does he do by application? He simply says, remaining faithful to God means to avoid idolatry or the pursuit of another God. We'll see that as we go through this. So I want to begin by saying something quite obvious, and then we'll move through this and just touch this lightly. But notice how he began again in verse 2. Thus says the Lord God. Notice, thus says the Lord God of Israel. He's simply beginning by making it uh, very clear that they have a special relationship with God. God has a special relationship with the nation of Israel. And so to, dis to establish this, it begins with a short reminder of how God had been with them throughout their history. In verse 2, he speaks of uh, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor. So he begins right by reminding them of the fact that they were not seeking God, but God had sought them. And God had done so throughout their entire history. And he's making it very clear that the one who did the work, and this is important for you to see, and I, I want to uh, just point this out very briefly, but he's saying God has done a work. God has done it on your behalf. And you can see that if you just read this really slowly. And, and I read through it, but he said this. God said, I took your father Abraham. I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave the mountains of Seir to possess. I sent Moses and Aaron. I plagued Egypt. I brought you out. I brought your fathers out of Egypt. He or I put darkness. Your eyes saw what I did. I brought you into the land. I gave them into your hand. I destroyed them. I would not listen. I delivered you out of his hand. I delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornet. I have given you the land. God is making it clear, and guys, we as the church today need to remember this. God is making it clear. You had the sword, but I gave the victory. You had your part, but I did it. I'm the one who sent that hornet. I'm the one who gave you the land. I'm the one who did it. God is simply reminding them. This is so important because they're going to be in a place soon. And you'll see this when we conclude this chapter. They're going to be in a place where the lands surrounding, the people surrounding them are going to be bringing their idols for the children of Israel to yield to. And God is simply saying through, through Joshua right now, you need to understand who did the work. You need to understand your history. You need to look back all the way to Abram. You need to remember that Abram came from a family of idolaters, his father Terah and Nahor and all. They were from a background of idolatry and God chose by his grace and mercy Abram and took him out of that, that evil environment that he was living in. The way that God, when you look in the New Testament, the way that God has taken you and God has taken me out of this world system that is rejecting him and hates him and has, and has set up a, a counterfeit religious systems and, and ways that oppose him. And then God, in his grace and his mercy, wherever you were and whatever you were doing at that time, God, in his grace and mercy, reached down into your life when you weren't even aware. And God did it through his grace. And he did it through a message called the gospel. And he did it through people praying for you and loving you and, and caring for you and telling you the truth and being willing to put up with your anger and being willing to put up with your argumentation and, and, and your resistance and, and your resentment. And it, yet mama kept praying for you. And dad kept praying for you. Your brother kept praying for you. Your, your wife, your sister, your, your aunt, your uncle, your grandma, whoever, your neighbor, your co-worker kept praying for you. And there we were in the miry clay. There we were in, in the in the sewage of the world. And God reached down. Can you rejoice in that? God reached down and he took you out of the miry clay and he put your feet on a solid rock. That's what God did. 
That's, we need to live there. We need to stay there. And that Joshua is giving him a word. He's saying, you have to look at your history. You have to look all the way back to Abram, a family of idolaters. God, with his grace and mercy, reached down and dragged him out, brought him out through his grace. God chose Abraham out of a family with a history of idolatry. Now, idolatry in its basic form is simply the veneration of something other than the true God. And, and when we've been going through Romans, we, we remember in chapter 1 of Romans, verse 25, how that Romans 125 speaks of those who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so God has taken us from this, this vain way of life and he has given to us truth through the gospel. God took Abram from a family of idolaters and God still calls us out of idolatry. And that message, as mentioned a moment ago, comes through the, the gospel. And, and the result of coming to faith in Christ is that we turn away from the idolatry that has filled our lives and we turn to the true and the living God. Like it says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, where Paul says, they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So Abraham's calling is brought to mind because it reveals the tremendous grace of God. Now he mentions uh, Nahor. Uh, that was Abraham's brother. And descended from Abraham's brother Nahor would be Rebekah, and her nieces Leah and Rachel. So he's speaking concerning their lineage. Now in verse 3, he makes it clear, Abraham was childless, but in his old age, and we know the story, he's just reminding them God gave him Isaac. Through Isaac came Jacob and Esau, and Esau ended up occupying uh, the land to the east of the Jordan. Now in verses 4 through 6, while Esau's descendants began occupying that region, over time Israel went to Egypt. And they spent centuries there, as we know, in bondage. And so after over four centuries of being in Egypt and the last portion being in bondage, he delivered the Jews. We know that story in the book of Exodus, how he did so through Moses and his brother Aaron. And so as he's speaking, and he's just highlighting this, he reminds them of the Red Sea crossing. He reminds them of how God overthrew Pharaoh's army. And then in verse 8, he says, I brought you into the land of the Amorites. So that speaks of how they began their initial uh, defeat of certain kings, and he makes mention of that. Now, verses 9 and 10 speaks, interestingly, of uh, Balak, where it says, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you, but I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore, he continued to bless you. I delivered you out of his hand. So he's simply reminding them of what had taken place. Balak wanted to bring a curse against the children of Israel. He couldn't do it, so he hired out an individual that he thought could, a man by the name of Balaam. And Balaam had spoken to him, and you can find that story in the book of Numbers. Balaam had spoken to him. It's recorded in chapters 22 through 24 of Numbers, and had said, I can't speak other than that which I'm told to speak. And so Balak wants him to bring uh, curses against the children of Israel. But God says, I'm intending to bless them and not curse them. And the very end, when he once again pronounces a blessing, we know the story. We know that Balak got really upset at Balaam and was saying, oh, I was going to make you a very rich man. All you continue to do is bring blessing. And so Balaam really wanted that money so he gave to Balak the plan. The plan is very simple. He said, God is a jealous God. God has commanded the children of Israel that they are not to have intermarriages with pagans. So if you can foment a plan for the children of Israel to begin to be with the pagans, God being a jealous God, and one who holds his word, God will bring judgment, which is exactly what happens as you look at the story of of Balaam, and what happens is they begin to mix with the uh, pagans around them, and God brought judgment. So he's speaking concerning that. He goes on into verses 11 through 13, 
went over the Jordan, came to Jericho. He's now speaking of their recent history. He's speaking about the recent conquest. And then that's why God says that he sent hornets. That's another way of saying God had fought on their behalf. And as he's just simply reminded them of that, and by the way, we could do that ourselves. And sometimes we, who are parents, have done that. Yeah, I've done that kind of thing with my own children in the past. Your father was a doper. Your father was an alcoholic. Your father was anti-God and anti-faith, anti-religion. My mom one time said to me, I'm praying for you. And I said to my mom, keep your prayers to yourself. Your faith in God, which my mom didn't know Jesus, but she had this background of you got to believe in God. And she saw how crazy I was. And so my mom says, I'm praying for you. And I say, keep your prayers for yourself because it's basically your crutch. And only the weak need crutches. I don't need your crutch. So just keep your prayers to yourself. I don't want you praying for me. So I've told my kids, your daddy was a monster. I was crazy. I liked my drugs. I liked my alcohol. I liked everything that went along with that. I rejected faith. But God, the way that God called Abram from a family of idolaters, but God, God reached down through the message of the gospel, and God pulled me out. And I've said to my children, you see the marriage your mom and your daddy have? Yes, Dad. Do you think it just happened? No, it didn't just happen. Because one day I was teaching a Bible study and I had prayed and I said to God, I said, Lord, like you put Adam to sleep to his desires, would you put me to sleep to mine? And just, I just want to serve you. And I said, Lord, you know that every woman that walks into my Bible study or that I see in church is being claimed for my wife. I claim her in the name of Jesus. And uh, Lord, I'm tired of it. And so I, I have a feeling, Lord, that you can select a better woman than I can. How many of you believe that? I believe that. I believe that. I believe that. I know that to be a fact. God, you can choose a better mate for me than I can because you know exactly what I need. Me, I'm a man. I have good eyes. And so what I see, I like but you've got to give me something that's deeper than the superficial, than, than the outside. It's got to be deeper than that. And I can't see the heart. You see, God can't. I can't. I don't know what I need. I don't know what I need today. I don't know what I'm going to need tomorrow. I can project. I can think. But I don't know. God, you have plans for me. You have plans for me. And you know what it's going to require for me to be able to do what you have for me. And therefore, I don't want to make the wrong selection because... You see, I've read my Bible, and the Bible says that marriage is for one man, one woman, one lifetime. I'm not going to go and shop around and try and find this one and try it out for a while like test driving a car. It's going to be what it is. So I don't want to make the wrong choices. And so God put me to sleep to my desires, and I prayed that sincerely. I go to teach a Bible study, and God brings in this little brunette. Now, my eyes were always on blondes, always on blondes. Yeah, and blue eyes. Yeah. Here comes this little brownie. <laughs> Bang. The right person at the right time. And I knew it. I was sharing this with someone just the other day. I've said this before. Some of you have heard this. Others haven't. Perhaps I said it even recently. Maybe it was to you that I said this. Forgive me if I repeat myself. I'm old. Yeah, I think I might have told you this, how my, <laughs> I'll say it anyway, I like the story. Uh, yeah, my cousins, remember I mentioned this to you? Did I say that on Wednesday my two cousins were with me and Marie was there and she's meeting my family? Did I share this with you? Yeah, well, some said yes. How many say no? Okay, I'm going to tell the story again. <laughs> I like the story. I might have said it on Sunday. Who knows? I talk so much. My two cousins. And Marie's there next to me. And my cousin's telling me. And I, my, I have some family members that are pretty, pretty rowdy, okay? So, and it's family, right? So they love me. I love them. I'm safe. So 
my cousin's saying my, my husband's in jail for murder, but, but he didn't kill him. And I'm just, this is, yeah, okay. I mean, that's family, yeah, okay. When's he getting out? Yeah, and she's talking. And then I turn and I'm, I'm, I look at Marie and I'm, I'm kind of like nervous because I'm thinking, oh, you're seeing the underbelly of my family. And I turn and I look at her and she's sitting right next to me and she's crying. And she's listening to my cousin give family stories. And the spirit of the Lord says, that's what you need in your life. That's the kind of woman you need. Someone who weeps for strangers. You see? See, God knows what you need. God knows the kind of person you need before you do. So a long time ago, I made a decision. Lord, your selections are better than mine. You know exactly what it is. That, see, and that's how God works. And so I tell my kids that. You know, the Lord pulled me out of the mud. You think that, that our marriage just happened? No, it was prayed through. We, we have battled through. We have kept the, the Lord the center of all of these years. We have walked together in the things of the Lord. We've gone through great times. We've gone through sad times. We've gone through the birth of children and, and a miscarriage. We've gone through it all. And as we've gone through it all, we have remained strong. And God is the one who has brought us to this place. You think our marriage is good because it just happened? It's not. It's good because of the grace of God. And you think the home that you're living in, the home that you're living in, is just something that happened? No, it is provided by God. He gave us the finances to buy this house. The cars that we drive, the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear, even getting our hair cut, all of that comes from God. And I've tried to teach my children that trust the Lord and look at what he's done because I guarantee you, if God had not saved me, I would be a doper to this day. I would be a drunk to this day. I'd have been a monster to this day. But God is gracious and God is good. And he changes lives. Hold fast to him. And that's what Joshua is saying. That's what Joshua is saying. He's saying, look at your history. Look at what God has done. All the way from Abraham, he gave you the land, defeated the kings, he sent the hornets. And that's why he's saying, even the cities that you're living in, you didn't build. God gave it to you. And the food that you eat, God provided. We need to understand that today. We really do. That's why he says in verse 14, Therefore fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord results in the service to the Lord. And he says, serve him. Serve him with sincerity. That word sincerity is really a word that we could use today for integrity. It speaks of that which is complete, unimpaired. That which is completely whole. It speaks of total devotion. He's saying, serve God completely with an unmixed heart. Serve him with all that you have within you. Pursue him and serve him in truth. The truth can speak in two various ways. One, it can speak with just the faithfulness that you have. You're serving him in a faithful and continual way. But it also speaks of making sure that you have true doctrine, that you hold fast to what God has actually said. So hold fast to him and hold fast to his word. Like Jeremiah says in chapter 15, verse 16, your words were found and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. So fear and sincerity and truth result in the proper service of the Lord. And he says in verse 15, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, well, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which, are, which uh, your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If it's displeasing to you to serve God, well, what are you going to serve? Basically, he's giving them a choice. Choose whom you will serve. Uh, what God? The Amorites, God? 
or the God of Israel, which God has been better to you? He's saying, I want you to serve God. Now, here's something for you. He's not, he's not saying, I'm giving to you a law that's going to make you serve God. I'm going to give to you an ordinance or a statute that will force you to serve God. What he's saying is, from sincerity of heart and truth, love God. And from the love that you have for God, you will serve him. How can you help but serve God? How can you help but serve God? Look how good he has been to you. Look how good he has been to you. How can you help but serve him? Sometimes I'll look at Marie. I'll say this very quickly, a little illustration. And I ask myself a very simple question. Who could love me more than this woman does? And the answer that I always get is nobody. Nobody ever did before, and nobody ever will after. And her love for me, which is to me unfathomable that she actually does, but her love for me is so pure and so real, how can I help but be faithful to her? How can I help it? It's not that I haven't had a chance to be unfaithful. Every man does. Every woman does. You, we all have chances to be unfaithful. They're, they're presented to us in one form or another. But how can you help but be faithful to a person who has loved you so much? Laws will say you should not commit adultery. That is God's word. But you know the love that God places in your heart for that man or that woman, while the law is not burdensome, it's not grievous, it's not difficult, it's something you agree 100% with. I will not commit adultery. I will not be unfaithful. Why? Because I'm in love. And when it comes to serving the Lord, you choose this day whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Why? Because the Amorites' gods are vicious monsters. And the God of Israel is gracious and loving. Look at all that he has done for you. In the New Testament sense, God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so as he's sharing that, the people answered, verse 16, and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. We will follow God faithfully and we will resist idolatry, even as it says in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, where God says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. They're saying there will be no other God but one God. This command, by the way, is also a New Testament command. 1 John 5, 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. So they're saying we will remain faithful. Well, verse 19, notice, Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he's a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. Just saying you're going to serve God doesn't guarantee that you will. There are a lot of people I've seen, even in this fellowship, who've said, I'm going to serve the Lord. Just saying you're going to do it doesn't mean you will. Without a changed heart and without God's power, it is impossible for you to actually serve the Lord. God is holy. God demands full worship. God is not to be trifled with. And he's saying, if you're not faithful to him, he will judge you, even though in the past he has blessed you. 
Well, they say in verse 21, the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Well, Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord for yourself to serve him. They said, we are witnesses. Now, therefore, he said, put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, the Lord our God, we will serve. And his voice, we will obey. Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. He took a large stone set it up, and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness to us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. And Joshua let the people depart, each to his own inheritance. So he said, your witnesses against yourselves, you've made this choice. Deuteronomy 23, 21 says, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. So he's saying, your words will be witness against you. You've made the vow, God will hold you to it. Well, the people said, he is our God. We will serve him. We will obey him. In other words, we will be faithful to God. We will follow him. And so he writes these words according to verse 26 through 28 in the book of the law of God. And he had a stone of remembrance. So he writes out this document. He places it in the scrolls of the law, and it's a reminder. And then he set up a stone of remembrance for a consistent reminder of the promise. When you go to Israel, there are still stones of remembrance, and they're not giant monuments or large rocks that you can picture something like this being large. But if you go to Israel, you'll see this. If you go into one of the cemeteries, which you, we actually pass by cemeteries and all, you'll see it um, on, the, uh, on the various grave sites because they bury their people in Jerusalem. They bury them above ground. And, and when you go by, there are all kinds of rocks that are placed on top of the, uh, the, the if you will, I'll call it a coffin, but it's really something different than that. It's like a sarcophagus. But... There are rocks that they come and they place on them. They're called stones of remembrance. And the reason is, very simply, that if you put a flower there, the flower is going to die. I mean, the fact that you cut the flower and place it there next to the grave, as we Americans do, we go and we have our vases and we put our flowers in those little vases and all in remembrance. We go there on Father's Day or Mother's Day or their birthday or an anniversary or whatever, and you go and you tend to that, that area there and then you put the flowers and all of that. Well, we put flowers there because that's what our custom is. But, but Marie and I are different. We, we will put flowers, you know, in the sights of our, of our parents who have gone to be with the Lord. But this last time when my mom went home to be with the Lord, just a couple of weeks ago, Marie and I went and we, we, put, we put the flowers that some people had given, some wreaths and all, and I placed them there. And all, but we took some rocks. And in the va there's actually, it, it, by their, uh, their stone there, uh, the headstone, um, I took some rocks and I dropped them inside the vase. And then we put our flowers there. Why? Because the rocks will last longer than those flowers. And Marie and I practice that as a symbol of a stone of remembrance because the rocks do not perish. The flowers do. And then that's the picture here. He's saying you'll have this stone here as a reminder or it's going to take a whole long, long time till time and the weather cause this stone, if ever, to no longer be present. As long as it's there, that'll be a constant reminder to you of your vow to God. And then he finally closes, and, and we'll close with this. It came to pass, verse 29, after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. They buried him within the border of in his inheritance at Timnath Sarah, which is in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gaash. Israel served the Lord. Notice verse 31. We'll return and close here in a moment. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. The bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, 
they buried at Shechem, in the plot of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamer, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of silver, and which had become an inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, the priest, and they buried him in a hill that belonged to Phinehas, his son, which was given to him in the mountains of Ephraim. These righteous men die. Joshua dies. Eliezer dies. The bones of Joseph are mentioned because Joseph had gone into Egypt. God had actually providentially sent him into Egypt so that he might preserve the life of his father and brothers. That's how they made it into Egypt in the first place. But he had spoken and said, when you leave this place, um, carry my bones from here, which they did. They took the bones with them. According to Exodus 13, 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you. You shall carry up my bones from here with you. And so he makes reference to the fact that the remains of Joseph had been transported, transported from Egypt and were now in a family plot. And the righteous generation dies. One last thing. When I mentioned verse 31, it's to me a sad comment. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. When they died, another generation arose who did not know the Lord. He did not know the Lord. This worship lasted one generation. One last thought, guys, and we'll close. I don't know how to say this. I'll say it as quickly as possible. Been a Christian for a while involved in ministry for a while. I have a lot of friends who are pastors. A lot of friends who are pastors. As a matter of fact, my closest friends, almost, almost all of my closest friends, not all, but almost all of my closest friends are pastors, pastors' families. And we know how difficult it is for one generation who had such incredible encounters with God to pass those things on to the, the next generation. The Jesus movement that exploded, I was just talking today, sharing how that Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, if you say Calvary Chapel, to this day, there's one Calvary Chapel, it's Costa Mesa. The rest of us associate with Calvary Chapel. So if you ever heard just two words, Calvary Chapel, they're not talking about Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, or Diamond Bar, Chino Hills, Upland, whatever. Calvary Chapel, to me, will always be Pastor Chuck's Fellowship, Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. That's how we used to speak, because there was only one Calvary Chapel. Now there's something like 1,500. 1,500 Calvary Chapels. There used to be one. So when we said, we're going to go to church, and they say, where'd you go? We say, we go to Calvary Chapel. There's only one. Now you say... Where you go to church, I go to Calvary Chapel. Which one? Because there's so many, right? Well, all of my pastor friends and I have had this conversation many times. And that is, will our children and the generation that we're raising, will they honor the God who saved us? That is a great challenge. Because through Joshua, and you have to get this, Joshua, this, these people that he's speaking about had come with Moses into the promised land. When Moses stayed aside and Joshua came across, they had been earlier with Moses. Moses died. Joshua brought them in. They conquest. They had conquest. They saw God move. They made their promise, we will follow you. Their children did not. Is it easy to raise a family to worship Jesus Christ? No. I have, like I said, a lot of friends. And I only know one out of 
the hundreds of pastors I know. I only know one who may have escaped some problems with his kids. Every other one, it was a war to communicate the gospel to children who just kind of just thought that's just the way it is for you. I still remember one of my children saying to me, well, Dad, that's your testimony. I have to forge my own. So I shot her. No. <laughs> okay, then here's part of it. You had a bullet wound. Why do you want to have your own testimony? Don't you know that I've been raising you so you wouldn't have one like mine? So you wouldn't have one like mine? I don't want you to have my testimony. I want you to have my God. I don't want you to go through the things I went through. I want you to be saved from those things. It's a difficult thing, isn't it, to raise those of you who are parents, to raise children to love Jesus because they think, well, that's you. That's just what you think. You know, you're not in my classroom. You're not with my friends. You're not in the scenes that I go to. You don't have a clue. See, my kids thought that I was born with a pulpit and a Bible. And it's not that at all. It's that I know the difference between gutter water and living water. And I wanted to keep my children from the gutter water. You can drink both. Living water is better. And I wanted them to have the living water. And I've been pouring into them. My kids are all adults. My kids have their own lives. But I still pour into them the things of God. Why? That's my job. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. That's what God has called us to do. Joshua's words ring in my heart, and I pray that it rings in yours because there's a generation arising who do not know God and the works he did. You'd see that in Judges chapter 2, the things that he did, because when the generation died, a new one rose up who did not follow the Lord. And that's the reason why you have the book of Judges, because God has to bring judges into the nation of Israel to deal with the sin that becomes rampant amongst the people who have rejected the God of Israel. Let us pray that God will work through us so that our children and our friends and those whom we love and those we influence will have one, have God as their Savior. Two, they can have a friend like us who love Jesus. And three, that our, if we're parents, that our children will have a mom and a dad who are sincere about the things of God, that they might be able to take this gospel until Jesus comes to another generation, that that new generation will love the Lord. That, to me, is the great challenge. But that's the desire of my heart, and I know it's the desire of yours too, that God would be exalted. May he be exalted through us.